we've actually gone through quite a lot with regards to usul al-tafsir and today the session we're going to do is asbab ikhtilaf al-tafsir the reasons why difference of opinion exists in tafsir why is it that scholars differ amongst themselves in tafsir and the reasons are much the same as you know why the different issues of fiqh yes yeah, differences of understanding differences of approach so what i'm going to do today is just go through maybe four or five major reasons why we find differences in tafsir and with examples as well again it's going to be quite a technical session uh, but inshallah this will be the last technical session i was planning to do a whole session on language language is probably arabic language is obviously the most important uh, aspect of tafsir uh, but i was going through my notes and i realized that you it won't be of benefit unless you know arabic in the first place otherwise it's just going to be lost so i'm going to skip that but just stress to us, we all know the importance of the Arabic language. We all know that we cannot understand Quran without the Arabic language. And not just a rudimentary level of Arabic language, but quite an advanced level of Arabic language for us to understand the Quran properly. So that's just something for us to bear in mind. So the, one of the, one of the, the first reasons we're going to talk about today is the Qira'at. We've talked about Qira'at, the different recitations of the Quran. Um, and... One of the reasons why scholars would differ in tafsir is because there's a difference of opinion about what constitutes a valid qira'ah and what, constitu- and what is not a valid qira'ah. So we said last, when we talked about qira'at, we said that a qira'ah to be valid is that it has to have a sahih, authentic chain of narration and uh, it must conform to the mushaf of Uthman. In terms of its, uh, in terms of the um, the, the letters and wordings. Um, but the majority of scholars, this is a minority view, and it seems to be a stronger view. But the majority of scholars they add a third condition, and that is that qira'ah must be mutawatir. It must be consecutive. It must be narrated by a mass number of people. Um, a minority view, like Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Jazz, and others, they said that um, <coughs> it's sufficient. They just have a sahih snad. It could be mutawatir or non mutawatir. So long as it's sahih and it conforms to the Musaf of the Arabic or of Uthman and it conforms to the rules of the Arab, Arabic language, then we accept it as a qira'ah. The majority scholar says, no, we add this extra condition, it must be mutawatir. So therefore, we will have qira'at that aren't mutawatir, but have authentic change of narration. And they conform to the Musaf and they are uh, conform to the rules of the Arabic language. So therefore, you find that these groups of scholars will differ whether this constitutes a valid qira'ah or not. And based upon that, they'll use it for tafsir or not. Right, and that's going to be a source of difference. Uh, we also talked about, in Qira'at, we talked about a shad Qira'at, an irregular or an odd Qira'at. Who can remind us what that is? A shad Qira'at, a shad recitation. Sorry? No, shad means odd. Shad means irregular. Yeah, it's a recitation that has an authentic isnad, but it doesn't conform to the Musaf of Uthman. It meets the requirements of the Arabic language. It has an authentic isnad, but it doesn't conform to the Musaf of Uthman. So, we, <coughs> when we're talking about Qira'at, we saw examples of Shad Qira'at and how they would be used in Tafsir of the Quran. However, the scholars don't, agree, don't all agree on their usage. So we find that some scholars said that we, we can't treat it as Qur'an anymore, which is correct. But neither can we treat it as a proof that can be used to explain Qur'an as well. And other scholars said, no, it's not Qur'an. We agree it's not Qur'an. But scholars say he is not, going back to the companion or whatever. And therefore, we can actually use it as a text to explain Qur'an. Right? So we have these two differing views. And obviously, they're opposing views. And whether you use a shad qira'ah or not will determine or direct your tafsir of the Qur'an. So an example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the kafara or the expiation of <coughs> uh, breaking an oath. Who knows what the expiation of breaking an oath is? Expiation of the kafara of breaking an oath. You make an oath in the name of Allah, you break it. Yeah? You feed 10 poor people, or you clothe 10 poor people, or you free a slave. And whoever can't do one of these three 
what does he do? He fasts for? No. Three days. He fasts for three days. So, فَكَفَارَتُهُ إِطْعَامُ عَشَّرَاتِ مَسَاكِينَ Sorry. مِنْ أَوْسَتِ مَا تُطْعِمُونَ So the kafara is that you feed ten poor people of the same food that you eat of yourselves, or the same regular food that you eat of yourselves. That you, so of the same food that you مَا تُطْعِمُونَ أَهْلِيكُمْ Of the same food that you feed your families. Right? أَوْ كِسْوَتُهُمْ أَوْ تَحْرِي رَقَبَةً Or you clothe them, or you free a slave. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ And whoever can't do any of these three, فَصِيَامُ ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَامِ Then he fasts three days. Okay. We have a shad qira'a of this ayah from Ibn Masud radiallahu anhu. Meaning by this is it's either a qira'a that was left, or it's like his tafsir that's been reported to us in a way that makes it look like it's a, a recitation. And he says, فَصِيَامُ ثَلَاثَ أَيَّامٍ مُتَتَابِعَاتٍ That you fast three consecutive days. So what's the difference between the ayah of the Qur'an and the actual shad qira'a here? What's the difference in wording? Yeah? The consecutive. the consecutive days, right. So those that say that the shad qira'a can be used for tafsir, the outcome is that for them, the fiqh ruling is that when you, if you can't find the first three options, you fast three days, but these three days have to be consecutive, one after another. And if you don't fast three consecutive days, <clears throat> You two have a break, it means you have to start all over again. <clears throat> Those who say that it's not a proof will say, no, the ayah, the, the ostensive sense of the ayah is three days, any three days will do. So we find this difference arising because of how they look at Shad Girat, how they approach Shad Girat. Make sense? Okay, language. As we said, language is incredibly important when it comes to tafsir. And easily 80-90% of Qur'anic tafsir is done based on language. Even the, narr the, the, the narrations of the Salaf that have come to us, you know, those who say that we do tafsir based upon the, uh, the narrations of a Salaf, the Sahaba, uh, the Tabi'een, the Taba Tabi'een, etc. The, the, their explanations of the Qur'an, how do they derive them? Most of it, you see, is from the understanding of language. So even themselves, they're actually using language to, use, to derive the tafsir. And only a very small amount of tafsir, as we said, we've been talking about the, um, uh, uh, the, found, the way of doing tafsir, only a very small amount of tafsir is actually explicitly narrated from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So, uh, the famous ayah of wudu, Ya iya ladheen amanu, Iza qumtum ila salati, faghsilu wujuhakum wa aidiyakum ila al-marafiq. وَمْسَهُ بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ وَأَرُجُولَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ That all you who believe, when you intend to stand for prayer, wash your faces and your hands up to the elbows. وَمْسَهُ بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ And wipe your heads وَأَرُجُولَكُمْ and, and wash your feet to the ankles. Okay. So, uh, there's based on the Arabic language, there's two or three different points that we can of difference that arise. So, first of all, Allah says, فَغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَىٰ الْمَرَافِقِ That wash your faces and your hands, and then use the word إِلَىٰ. إِلَىٰ means in Arabic? Two. two right. إِلَىٰ الْمَرَافِقِ to the, to the elbows. Now, the scholars of language differ about the usage of the word إِلَىٰ. When I say I'm going to the house, I'm going to the, to, the, to the oven. Does the word to include the oven or does it end just before the oven? Right? Does that make sense? I'm going to the house. Does the word to, in English as well, does it include entering the house or does it include just stopping outside the door of the house? Right? In English, you get the same sort of uh, you know, uh, usage as well. So now, because, the way, because of the way the scholars understand it, they will differ about whether this washing of the, the arms up to the elbows includes the elbows or doesn't include the elbows. And if it includes the elbows, is it an obligation or an obligation, right? Based upon this usage of the word ilah here. وَمْسَهُ بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ And wipe your heads. And he uses the word ba. Literally, that would mean wipe with your heads. Right, wipe with your heads. Um, now, the word ba 
again, the Arab scholars of Arabic language will differ, and they will say, uh, depending on how you understand the usage of the word ba, this letter ba, rather, does it mean that you have to wipe the entirety of the head, or does it mean you, to, you can wipe a portion of the head? Right. And again, depending on how you understand the usage of the word, the particle ba here, the harf ba here, you will rule either the whole of a head must be wiped, or you rule that a minimum is that a portion of it must be wiped. Um, and then we get the famous part of this ayah that all of us will be aware of, I hope. Biru'u <coughs> biru'u sikum wa arujulakum. Wipe your heads wa arujulakum. The lamb has got a fatty, you can read this in one of two ways. Wa arujulakum wa arujulikum. What's the difference? Wa arujulakum and arujulikum. What's the difference? Fatah and kasra. So. If you read about Fatha, then you are talking about wiping, I'm sorry, washing, washing your feet. And if you read it with a Kasra, you're talking about wiping the feet, right? So obviously the Sunnah here will explain to us when we wash our feet and when we wipe our feet. But we have these two Mutawati Kira'at, Arujulakum, Arujulikum, we talked about this when we talked about Kira'at as well, right? Now. Uh, in the Arabic language, they said that, um, some scholars said that actually there's a usage of the Arabic language that allows you to uh, link the case of the word to the previous case, even though the meaning may not be linked. So, because it's easier to recite. So it's easy to be recite biru'usikum wa arujulikum, it's still kasa and kasa in both the words. Then it is to recite biru'usikum wa arujulakum, but you know, because you you're, you're, you're swapping from kasa to a fatah. But the meaning would still be in their eyes that the arujulakum, it's the meaning is arujulakum, but the fatah is turned to a kasa just because it's easy to recite and it's link and it's adjoining a word that's majrur, it's in the genitive. So because of this, you will see that this difference of opinion in, in the language you will see that this group of scholars say that even the recitation that says arjulikum actually means arjulakum. Whereas the others will say, no, actually, arjulakum means washing and arjulikum means wiping. And we go to the sunnah to explain when. So again, the understanding of the usage of the Arabic language here in arjulakum will, will, you know, will determine a difference of opinion. So, you know, for this particular example, we're not saying that there are madahib out there or scholars that say you're just wiping over your feet. Bare feet. Bare feet yeah. No, there's not, there's not, the Shia would say that, but not the Sunnis. No what Sunnis they are that. saying is that what, what, if, if, they, if they read it in that manner, they're saying that... This ayah means this. This ayah means that over, over your bare feet you're washing. Yeah. But over, over your socks you're wiping. But the socks bit they will take from the Sunnah of the Messenger. At least yeah. Just, yeah. Okay, another example of... There's lots and lots of examples of these particle usages, right? So you, the usage of the harf in the Arabic language, it's it's a it, we may think it's very simple. Min means you know from and ila means to and ba means with and and o means or and wa means and, but actually there's a lot more subtlety involved, a lot more nuance in there, and you find that a lot of the differences of opinion in tafsir and in fiqh as well is because just of the simple differences in usage of these particles. particles. The word. Harf like ba ila whatever. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we talked about in language in the very beginning how words can have more than one meaning. An example of this that leads to difference of opinion is nikah, right? The word nikah, we understand it to mean marriage. Um, but to be more precise, it can have one or two meanings. It can either mean the marriage contract or the act of marital relations, right? both are marriage, right? Nikah can mean the actual act of marital relations or the marriage contract. So for example, يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا نَكَحْتُمُ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ ثُمَّ تَلَّقْتُمُوهُنَّ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ تَمَسُّوهُنَّ To the end of the ayah. So who believe, if you make nikah with a believing women and then divorce them before having touched them, then to the end of the ayah, you get, you get uh, about the ayah about the iddah. What does the word nikah here mean? Yeah? It means the sign of marriage. 
So the the contract, yeah. the contract of marriage. Why? Because before you touched him, I. It's not talking about actually having marital intercourse. But now we go to the ayah of Surah An-Nisa, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wala tankihu ma nakha abaukum min an-nisa illa ma qad salaf." And do not make nikah of women your fathers make nikah of, unless it's a thing of the past. Meaning, from now onwards, you can't do this. Do not make nikah. Of women your fathers made nikah to. Now, if you understand nikah to mean the contract, it means that you're not allowed to make, you're not allowed to marry women your fathers married, even if they never consummated the marriage. But if you understand nikah here to mean consummation, then it means that you can marry women your fathers married but didn't consummate the marriage with. And this you find a difference of opinion here. He's, he's grimacing, he's like, ew, ew. <laughs> so what's the opinion now? Sorry? What is the opinion now? Um, Which of the two? I'm just giving of opinion, the difference of opinion here. He's getting excited, man. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> can I, man? just don't do it, full stop. Just don't do it, full stop, man. Um, there's all these examples I'm giving here of uh, general and specific, etc. I'll, I'll skip all those. <coughs> abrogation. So that's that's another thing we've talked. We haven't talked about abrogation yet. But the scholars differ a lot about which verses are abrogated and which verses are not abrogated. Right? You find you know, like opinions from like only five verses in the entire Quran are abrogated to like five hundred verses of the Quran are abrogated. Right? And the reality is that there's only very few actual explicit abrogated verses in the Quran. Meaning by abrogation that a ruling in a later verse cancelled out a ruling of an earlier verse. But that's what we talk about abrogation. Now, abrogation nasq is the Arabic word. Uh, the word, the word nasq in the usage of a salaf differed from the way it differs when it's used later on. In the usage of a salaf, like Ibn Abbas, they used to use the word, word, they used to use the word nasq, abrogation, to mean that a later verse specified or restricted the meaning of an earlier general verse. This is like, if you like, it's a way of nasq, right? And a verse is general, and then later on you find a verse that actually says it's actually not, you can't, it's not general to every single case. It's only, general, it's only applicable to some cases. They use the nusk in this. And then the later scholars, when they use nusk, they refer it to mean, they use it to mean an ayah that's, whose ruling has been cancelled out. There was a ruling early on in Islam, and later on the ruling was cancelled out altogether. Um, so, uh, scholars differ, as I said, about as it regards to which verses are abrogating, which verses are abrogated. That obviously will lead to difference of opinion. Also, the scholars differ, and this was something a question that was asked, we said very early on, is what is legitimate abrogation? What, what is legitimate to abrogate? So, for example, they said, can the Sunnah abrogate the Quran? Can a ruling from the Sunnah abrogate a ruling from the Quran? So, can the Quran abrogate the Quran? This is, you know, that's clear. Can the Sunnah abrogate the Sunnah? This is clear, right? Can the Qur'an abrogate the Sunnah? Yes. Now the other way around. Right? Can the Sunnah abrogate the Qur'an? Right. In terms of rulings. Some scholars will say yes, some scholars will say no. The stronger view is yes. Right. Um, but obviously this will lead to a difference of opinion. In cases of for abrogation, has I, can a ruling of the Qur'an be abrogated, cancelled out by a Sunnah? If you say yes, then there are certain rulings that will be abrogated in this way. So a famous example of abrogation in the Qur'an is what we know about our alcohol, right? So, yes, they ask you about uh, alcohol and gambling. Say that there's a great sin in them. But there's also a benefit. But the sin is greater than the benefit. This was early on. The Arab society, they loved their drink. They loved like today, this, the kufal today. They loved their drink, right? In this ayah, Allah doesn't actually, doesn't actually forbid he doesn't actually forbid alcohol. He just says, there's good and there's bad, but the bad is worse. Then later on, 
لا تقربوا الصلاة وأنتم سكارى That all you who believe don't approach the salah in a state of intoxication حتى تعلموا ما تقولون until you know what you're saying right. And this is again, this actually ayah tells us the wisdom behind one of the wisdoms behind prohibition of alcohol that we lose control of our senses we're no longer aware of what we're saying, what we're doing right. So here again, Allah doesn't make a blanket prohibition of alcohol Now we have a prohibition but it's for a very specific thing So we had a blanket allowance where it's just you know prohibited and there's benefit but the prohibition is worse or the, the evil is worse Now we have a specific prohibition If you want to pray, don't pray in a state of intoxication right. And then the final one as we all know يَا إِيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسِرُ وَالْأَنْسَابُ وَالْأَزْلَمُ وَالْرِجْسُ مِنْ عَمْلِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَاجْتَنِبُوا That all you who have faith, alcohol, gambling, sacrifices to idols and divining arrows are all the, an abomination of the work of shaitan So stay away from it So now we've got the actual final abrogation It's, it, ruled, it, um, it actually cancels out the early rulings completely So abrogation is a major source of differences of opinion in tafsir i.e. what is abrogated, what is abrogated what can abrogate, what can't abrogate so we mentioned three so far or two actually, what, what, three actually, what have I mentioned so far sources of abrogation, sources of difference of opinion Shad. yeah, shahad and mutawad al-qira'at what's a qira'a and the uses of shahad qira'at yep. Yeah, particular scholars look at the Arabic language and then so the Arabic language. Abrogation, yeah, good. Exactly. Israeliyat, we talked about Israeliyat. The extent of their usage will determine difference of opinion in tafsir. So we gave uh, uh, three categories of Israeliyat those that conform with the Quran, we said is true, those that contradict the Quran, we said is false, and those that are the Quran and Sunnah are silent about, we said that we also remain silent about them. They can be used, they can be narrated. Not all scholars differ, you know, agree in every single detail of, of what I said previously. And uh, so their usage and the extent of their usage will determine differences of opinion. So, for example, we have in Surah Al A'raf, Allah SWT is talking about the creation of mankind, he's talking about Adam and Hawa. That he is the one who created you from one soul. And from that soul he made its mate, so that he might find comfort in her. Um, uh, and then one of them, when one, and then when he uh, lay with her, and she conceived a light bird, and she became pregnant. Uh, and she walked about freely with it. And then she gets, you know, starts growing heavy. She gets heavily pregnant. فَلَمَّا أَثْقَلَتْ دَعَوَ اللَّهَ دَعَوَ اللَّهَ رَبَّهُمَا لَإِنْ أَتَيْتَ هَنَا صَالِحًا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ They make a dua to Allah. When she becomes heavily pregnant, they make a dua to Allah. And that dua is, if you give us a righteous child, we would be amongst the grateful. فَلَمَّا أَتَاهُمَا صَالِحًا And then when he granted them a healthy, upright child, جَعَلَ لَهُ شُرَكَاء فِيمَا أَتَاهُمَا They associated partners with him in what he had given them. فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ عَمَّا يُشْرِكُونَ But Allah is far above what they associate. Uh, these verses in Surah Al-A'raf, the scholars have a huge amount of difference as to exactly what they're referring to. Do they refer to Adam and he, Eve, in which case you, they have to explain the fact that Allah is saying that they committed shirk with, uh, Adam, with him when it, came to their, with, with, uh, when it came to their child? Or is it an usage of the Arabic language that's really not talking about them but talking about their progeny? Right? These are two different views. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he says that when Adam lay with her, she became pregnant. And then Iblis came to them. And he said, I am the person who caused you to be ejected from paradise. You must obey him or this child that will be born would be born deformed or dead. And I will do this and I will do that. And so... Uh, Shaitan says to Iblis says to him, you must give your child the name Abu Harith and then if you give him this name he'll come out healthy they refuse and the baby is still born she becomes pregnant again the same thing happens again the baby is still born 
she becomes pregnant again and he comes back and now they're overcoming with compassion they don't, they don't want another child to die and so they obey Shaitan, Iblis and they call their child Abu Harith and then they give birth to a healthy child and then Ibn Abbas said this is what Allah means when he says that when he granted them a healthy upright child they associated partners with him in what he had done in, in what he had given them but Allah is far above what they associate so uh, Ibn, Ibn Kathir he says that this is Ibn Abbas using a case of the Israeliyat to use a Quran and some of the scholars they, they agree with Ibn Abbas like At-Tabari and they say that you know Ibn Abbas used to take from the Muslims of the Ahl Kitab and his explanation here is an authoritative explanation of this particular ayah a large number of scholars, Ibn al-Qayyim, al-Razi, uh, al-Razi, they strongly argue against this. No, this is not talking about Adam at all. It's talking about his progeny uh, at all. But the point being here is that the scholars differ because of their uh, reliance on the narration that Ibn Abbas quotes or not. And the reliance on Israeliyat or not. And those of the scholars who said that, who actually took the view of Ibn Abbas and used his Israeliyat, they said that the meaning of shirk here isn't shirk where you're actually directing worship to another besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shirk here is more in its linguistic sense where you're directing obedience without worship to another besides Allah. So what he says, if you look at the, they say if you look at the narration of Ibn Abbas, what they've actually done is they just obeyed shaitan in an issue of naming their child. They haven't actually worshipped shaitan. There's done nothing like that at all. It's pure obedience. And obedience in itself or following the command of someone in and of itself is not worship unless it's accompanied with you know, ta'adheem and so on and all, all of these things. So they said the shirk here, even in that view, is more of a lexical usage rather than a shari'i usage. It's not real shirk. It's associating partners in the sense they obeyed him instead of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or they should have obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you just turn the oven off? Turn the knobs around and he's closing. And the other will go off, inshallah. And then if you, yeah, that's fine. So the use of Israeliyat. The fifth is the role of the intellect. Does our intellect, our rationale, our common sense take precedence over revelation or not? Okay. Obviously, Ahl Sunnah would you say no. Right. Revelation is supreme, everything else is subservient to it. There were groups who said the opposite. They said that pretty much the intellect, the rationale, the sound rationale takes precedence over the revelation, i.e. our intellect will judge what the revelation actually means. Famously in the past is the Mu'tazila. Contemporarily, we still have them, right? modernists. And if you look at today's liberalists and modernists, if you look at their the essence of what they talk about, where it's all coming from, it's their, it's not even their aql if you look at it, it's just, most of the, their logic, most of their so-called logical, rational reasoning is just stupid, right? It's, the, it's their hawa. But theoretically, let's say, it's, it's, their, it's, it's, their, it's their aql that they're using to judge the Qur'an. So you find the liberals and the modernists today amongst the Muslims, or those who claim they're Muslims, using their aql to actually judge the meaning of the Qur'an, and to judge the meaning of the sunnah and to actually, when it comes to the sunnah, to accept and reject hadith based upon what they think is rational or not right? and when it comes to the Qur'an, to re-explain the Qur'an when it doesn't make sense to them um, Famous examples of the past, and they still exist today Jinn So, some of the Mu'tazila rejected as jinn, the existence of a jinn altogether They said that to them it doesn't, rush, it doesn't rationally make sense and so they explain jinn to mean other things. Uh, today's modernists do the same thing. And for example, they will use jinn to explain, to refer to, like, this is just another way of talking about hidden diseases. Germs. Yeah. Germs, yeah, and so on, yeah. So the jinn refers to germs. Because at that time, they said, the people were too simple to understand the reality that the Quran is talking about. And only later on, as our knowledge increased, and us, you know, as science became more advanced, they began to understand, you know, how illnesses are transmitted. And then the jinn, the reference to the jinn is are these hidden, unseen ways of transmitting diseases. So all this possession and all this, all of, none of it exists in their eyes. All of it, all it really is, is just illnesses transmitted by these hidden factors 
which we call jinn, which the Quran calls jinn. Likewise, magic, sihr, and evil eye, ain, all of this is no, none of it's true. It's just um, uh, metaphorical ways of talking about transmission of things that are that were to them hidden, but to us apparent. Yeah, you had your hand up. How would they explain things like when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa ma khadaqna jinna wal insa illa liyabudu," and we do not create a man and jinn kind except? Yeah. So, what they will say is that the jinn are not a species of you know a creature made out of fire that's hidden to us. Rather, it is a it is a either a sub tribe of the angels or a sub tribe of mankind. So mankind is like the angelic, like so when you have jinn and man together, jinn refers to the rebellious con- group of mankind, and mankind refers to the like the, the, the non rebellious group of mankind. That's how they would explain it. And the final thing we talk about today, I've left a lot of things out actually, but um, just to keep it short today. Uh, differences concerning authenticity of hadith and also the narrations. So, much as, again, this is very similar to the issues of fiqh. Scholars may differ because, first, a hadith, a hadith may not reach a particular scholar. right? And because they're unaware of a particular hadith, this leads to um, uh, differences of opinion. So, uh, an example of this from the time of the Sahaba, actually, is the waiting period of a woman whose husband has died and she's pregnant. Right. So the waiting period of a whose husband has died is what? Four months. Four months and? Ten days. Ten days. Four months and ten days. The waiting period for a woman who's pregnant until she gives birth. So we have a verse saying the same two things. Those of you who die and leave wives behind them, their waiting period is four months, ten days. As for those who are pregnant, the term should be the time they deliver. So, Ali and Ibn Abbas, they gave the fatwa initially that for a woman whose husband has died and is also, and also pregnant, her waiting period is four months and ten days. Right. The longer of the two periods, rather. That's the fatwa they gave. It's longer of the two periods. Say that again. The longer of the two periods. Between four months and ten days or... Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. So if, if, for example, she gives birth and then still some time remains, then it's that of the, of the four months and ten days, then she must finish off the okay. four months and ten days. If she... Uh, four months and ten days have finished, but she's still got... I don't know how that would work, actually. <laughs> how that would work. Yeah, yeah. It's actually the four months and ten days, pretty much. Now... Then the hadith reaches them that uh, talks about that uh, one of the female Sahabia, her husband dies and she was pregnant and she left her idda after she gave birth, even though time remained of the four months and ten days. And the Messenger of Allah was aware of this and he endorsed it. This is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. When they become aware of this, Ali and Ibn Abbas, they changed their fatwa. So this is an example of a hadith that they were unaware of, they later became aware of, and it impacted the understanding of the verses of the Qur'an, which then impacted the fiqh ruling itself. Um, this category is very small, like in fiqh as well, especially in nowadays, late, later generations. The, the, the reality of a, a scholar or a group of scholars being unaware of a hadith is highly unlikely and very rare to find. Right? Um, the Most of the differences of opinion, like in fiqh and in tafsir in this hadith section is, the hadith, they're aware of them, they understand them differently. Or, it, the hadith reaches them, but it reaches them via a change of narration that they, be, that they rule to be weak. So you can have multiple chains of narration in this hadith, right? It reaches some scholars via change of narration that they rule to be authentic, in which is some scholars by change in narration that they rule to be weak. So they differ, so it's an authentic hadith and a weak hadith. So because of this, some scholars will use it, some scholars won't use it in, in terms of fiqh rulings. In today's day and age, though, that is... Again, in today's day and age, it's, 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 a, it's almost uh, not, to, not to be found. As I said, the, the majority case, in fact, almost all cases now is that, you know, hadith are all being codified, the takhrij has been done, the analysis has been done, the rulings have been given, 
and most of the differences because they understand them in a different way. Does some of it come down to the fact that when I'm Hanafi, I'm never, I'm never going to change, or I'm Hanbali and I'm, I'm never going to step outside of that? It does. Some of it does come down to that, but uh, I would again argue that that's you'll find that probably more amongst the general masses, and that's a legitimate stance for them to take because they're not any better. Amongst the scholars, you won't really find that anymore, right? Um, uh, or rather, what they'll say is that um, the Hanafi school, for example, isn't the, the school of just one or two people. It's a school of 1,200 years worth of scholarship, right? And everything's been explained, and, they, and they're convinced by that. And only really, very rarely will you find them changing when they're convinced by something else, but generally they're convinced by their, by their school. So differences of understanding of the same text, as I said, this is, this is where most of the differences of opinion comes. So when it comes to recitation of Fatiha behind the Imam, right, in, in congregational prayer, وَإِذَا قُرِعَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْسِيَتُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ That when the Qur'an is recited, listen to it in silence, in order that Allah has mercy upon you. When the Qur'an is recited, listen to it in, in silence and pay attention, so that Allah may have mercy upon you. So now the scholars differ, right? So now we have this ayah, and then we have فَقْرَ أُمَّةِ يَسْرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Recite whatever is easy, whatever goes, comes easy for you of the Qur'an. So we have that as well. And then we have... Uh, uh, all these set of hadith that talk about there's no prayer for the one who doesn't recite al-Fatiha or you know uh, Fatiha is the Umm al-Kitab whatever there's no prayer for whoever does, recites a, uh, does a prayer without uh, without the Fatiha it is deficient it's deficient it's deficient right so now the scholars they all know these texts right now they, they all uh, uh, start differing amongst themselves There'll be those that say that the wording of the Qur'an is supreme. The wording of the Qur'an is clear. Right? And then the hadith are subservient to that. And therefore they will say that what's obligatory in the prayer is recitation of the Qur'an. Not necessarily Fatiha. Fatiha is recommended but not obligatory. It's meaning if you recite a prayer theoretically without Fatiha, your prayer is valid. Why? Because for them, these verses in the Qur'an are general. When the Qur'an is recited, listen to it. Uh, Sorry, not this one, but Fakra uh, in the Quran. Recite whatever is easy of the Quran for you. Or whatever is easy. Here they say that Allah has mentioned it generally. He hasn't said recite Fatiha. He said whatever is easy. Right. So they would use that ayah to show that recitation of, and they have other arguments as well, but that, that the recitation of Fatiha is not obligatory or a pillar of the prayer. The others will say, majority of scholars will say, that no, the hadith are used to explain that ayah. And uh, will show us that the meaning of this uh, ayah is the recitation of Al-Fatiha as a pillar, and then after that you can recite whatever you want to, that's easy for you of the, of the prayer, of the, of the Qur'an. Now when it comes to that in terms of and the difference of opinion uh, with regards to whether the Fatiha is a pillar or not, and they're all using the same text. The second one is when the Imam is reciting loudly in the prayer, Al-Fatiha, what do I do as, as a follower? Do I listen to his Fatiha and not recite it myself? Do I listen to his Fatiha and then start and then when he's finished Fatiha, recite Fatiha myself when he starts reciting another surah? Or do I recite Fatiha regardless? Regardless, but recite it quietly within myself. Right. Um, so some scholars will say that this 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 ayah of the Quran is clear. When the Quran is recited, listen to it and pay attention. Therefore, in prayer, when the Qur'an is being recited and you can hear it, listen to it means you can hear it, then you just be quiet and listen to it and pay attention. When the Imam is reciting quietly, or you can't hear his recitation, then, and even if it's a loud prayer, but you can't hear his recitation, then you recite loudly. Right. Why? Because they said, uh, this ayah, the meaning of this ayah is very clear, and it specifies the meaning of the hadith. When the hadith are talking about there's no prayer without al-fatiha, Especially this ayah specifies it, meaning there's no prayer without a fatiha in those prayers that are not loud. Because the fatiha is still happening, you're just not exactly the fat- Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Others will say no. The when the hadith are very clear, explicit. There's no prayer without a fatiha. The prayer without a fatiha is deficient, defi- deficient, deficient, it's incomplete. These uh, are used to explain the ayah. There's so many of these types of the hadith they used to explain the ayah. So. Uh, this they say that regardless of whether the Imam is reciting loudly or not, we must recite the Fatiha uh, behind the Imam because the Hadith are very, very explicit, very, very clear, and there's so many of them as well. 
So again, the point being here, it's the same texts are being used by everybody. They're approaching them in different, they're giving different weight to these texts, number one. And they're also shedding different, they're understanding these texts in a different way as well. Am I making sense? What's a stronger view in my view, again, this is just me, uh, is that in the loud prayers you listen, in the quiet prayers you recite. Yeah, that's the one that takes, in my view, seems to bring all the texts together. Just the question off the back of this. Um, so, somebody could be sitting through these lessons and thinking, okay, I'm really confused now. Like, because I'm not a scholar. Mm -hmm. What do I do? So, what is your advice for the lay person who can't make sense of this themselves? What do they do in that situation? They, the, lay person, the lay person, generally speaking, follows a scholar or follows someone he trusts for his knowledge. And then his duty is done. His duty is just trying to find the scholar and trying to ascertain that he's a scholar of the Sunnah. Yeah. He does his best there. That's his duty done. And then he follows the rulings of. Okay. of, yeah. of. Even if that scholar doesn't follow a mother, doesn't matter. Even if that scholar gives, you know, picks and chooses himself from different madhabs, it doesn't yeah. matter. His, his obligation is done. But with the point of a madhab, um, I mean, I, I get the picking and choosing, depending on whether that scholar feels that something is stronger or not. But you should generally follow a madhab, right? Yes. Yeah. I believe as a layman, you should generally follow a madhab. Yeah. Um, and only once you get to a certain level of... So following a madhab, there's, there's, there's blindly a... Blindly following a madhab. Yeah. That, or not, not, it's not blindly, it's, I think the better word is bigoted, bigoted yeah. following of madhab, right? So we need to understand that the madhab is just a tool for us to uh, access the sunnah of the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. The goal is the sunnah of the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. That's the goal. The madhab is just a tool. That's all it is. It's nothing more than a tool. The problem people, and why, why I say bigoted, the problem is in they made the madhab the goal, and forgotten about the sunnah as being the goal, and they really, haven't realized that the, the madhab is just a tool. So the so the um, so the what and what's the difference here now? The difference is really a point of belief. Practically speaking, it will not impact the practical pract the practical worship or life of a Muslim. It will not impact this. It's a point of belief. The belief is this: that if the sunnah ever becomes clear to me, and my madhab becomes clear to me that it's wrong, then I have to follow the sunnah. That's the belief, right? If I understand that the sunnah is the goal and the madhab is, is a tool, that belief is clear and I'll, I'll accept it. But if I think that the madhab is the goal, then I will never change even if the sunnah becomes clear to me, right? So do you understand the difference? That's, that's the belief. Because the goal is the sunnah, my belief is if it ever becomes clear to me that my, my, my madhab is wrong or my scholar is wrong, I will leave my scholar and my madhab and follow the sunnah. Practically speaking, this will never happen, right? Or it will, it's very, very rare that this will happen, practically speaking. But the point is the one of belief. Because it's important for us to understand that the goal is the sunnah of the messenger والسلام, and the scholar and the madhab is nothing more than a tool to access the sunnah. Just to complicate this a little bit more, let's say you have multiple people of knowledge that you trust, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know, one of them has a particular uh, opinion, right, fiqhi opinion on something. Mm. And they say, these are my reasons for it. But another one who you also trust says, well, actually. Well, in Al-Masjid, we see that every day, every, yeah, every yeah, week. Right? Yeah. So, so we have like three or four that? people of knowledge and they, give, they will give you they different answers. Different rulings, yeah. Right? So in this case, you just follow the one you trust the most. Yeah. That's, that's all it is. The person you trust to have, be most wide read, the most studied. Yeah. You can't pick and choose there. You, you can't, can't pick and choose well, there. You know what? That one sounds all right. That sounds easy like, for me. I'll do that. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> no, because then what you're doing there is just following what you think is. So you might not be a scholar in there, but what you're looking at is, okay, they're putting the evidences forward, right? I trust all of them, they're putting the evidences forward. This is the one that makes most, most sense. Yeah. That's what I'm going to go with. So, if you're, so you can do that, and, and so long as you're clear that you're not following your desires. Yeah. It's not like I'm following the easier view. Yeah. And if, you, if you've worried about that, you just follow that of those three or four people you've asked. Just follow the one you trust the most. Okay. Yeah. Or if you trust them equally, and, <laughs> and they give... They both give quite good explanations, don't they? Just follow the person you trust. But you trust them equally. It's your problem, man. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have asked both of them, you should you go to one of them. And that's, another, and that's another thing I would actually say is that while they're going to multiple people for the same question, if you trust them equally, just go to one of them and get an answer. See, I was told something different by an, an, an elder brother. He was like, no, you should. Because uh, I remember. Weigh like, the evidences. You, because uh, I remember going to your classes, obviously, for a long time. And then when we um, did uh, some classes with Maksud, and his was different. 
and I just it just confused the heck out of me. Mm. And he said to me, the brother said to me, this is a good thing. You should take different. And I'm like, I'm confused now. So, yeah. What then, do you do so that so that's that's why I I say for a lay person they shouldn't take they shouldn't right. It's only when you're in the path of knowledge. That you know, you start looking at differences, and then you find the mistakes of your scholar from other people. That's because you studied, right? But for a lay person, just follow the person you trust. So in our case, and if you have more, if you have more than one person in the masjid you trust, just go to one person. Don't go to all of them. Yeah. yeah. So we've got you. We've got your mama. We've got Sheikh Maksud. Just go to one of you. Just go to one. Get the answer and leave it. And just yeah. stay with that. Yeah. yeah. I still feel like there's still a, <laughs> there's still a flaw in that because, for example, this literally happened where I asked you a question, and then. Person B went and asked another person and they came to me and they said, oh, you can't do that because person, this sheikh said that you can't do it, which is also a person that we trust. And then I went and asked that sheikh and he said, yeah, you can't do it. And I'm like, then you're in a predicament, you're like... No, you're in a predicament yeah, because yeah. You, and you put yourself in it. Well, you, ask, you, you ask one person, that's what you should follow. It doesn't matter what somebody else has told you. Okay. He's asked somebody else, he follows what he, that person said, you follow the person you asked. Yeah, it's right. So you know the example that we just spoke about reciting um, in the loud prayers and quiet prayers. One thing I've noticed, I think amongst the, uh, the Shafi uh, Madhab or people who follow the Shafi Madhab, they, they recite the Surah Fatiha, uh, the recite Fatiha, Surah Fatiha uh, after Imam finishes. Yeah. Is that a difference of opinion? That's a difference of opinion, yeah. and that's, that, so that's one of the ways that's called to reconcile it. So what, what the Shafi Imam would normally do is after Al Fatiha, have a short gap before he starts reciting. And in that short gap, the followers are very quickly reciting Al Fatiha to get it to catch up. So a lot of my friends are like from Samad. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've got another question. Um, if, you, if there's more than one opinion on something, what's wrong with um, sort of going by two opinions, for example? If, both, if there's two opinions, for example, and they've both been proven to be correct, and they've both got authentic narrations, what's wrong with like using them both, like using one on some occasion and using the other on a different occasion, if they're both... What well, if they're contradicting them. opinions, which is what most of the cases are, what if they're opposite opinions? You can't say it's haram one point and haram halal the other point, right? Mm. So you just if, it's, if it's not haram, if it's not haram, like then... So there's another principle which is um, avoid a difference of opinion. So you take the opinion, if you're given multiple opinions, you take the opinion that nobody will say is wrong. Or nobody will say object to you for for, for right. So um, uh, so if somebody says that, let me think of an example. Uh, we actually, I mean, we talked about bid'ah and sunnah. We actually gave an example of this in bid'ah and sunnah. So bid'ah is basically like the things that we will say is bid'ah and haram, and we say you can't do it, and they always say actually you sh you should do it because it's it's a bid'ah hasna whatever right. But they won't say if you don't do it, you're doing, doing something sinful. So, but we're saying if you do it, it's sin, something sinful, right? So the way to avoid the difference of opinion is what? Don't do it. If you don't do it, everybody's happy. Go with the safer option. Go with the safer option, right? Yeah. So that's not applicable in all cases. But, so, but in many cases, you'll find that when you find all these multiple views, there's going to be one view that everybody's actually generally happy with. Uh, you haven't done anything haram in any of these points of view. You may have done something makru or mandu or whatever, but you haven't done, have done anything haram. So that's one way. But if you have two contradictory opinions, you can't just do one thing at one. It's haram for you one one day, but it's halal for you the other day. That, that doesn't make that doesn't make any logical sense whatsoever. You just follow the scholar you trust, and that's it. Um, <laughs> okay. Another major point of uh, that leads to difference is, is aqidah, right? You've you've got a preconceived belief, and then you use that belief to interpret the Quran. Where it should be the other way around, right? You use the Quran to extract belief. But you've already decided what your belief is. And now you come to the Quran and the Sunnah and you see these texts and you find, okay, you know what, these don't really agree with my belief. I don't like these texts. And then you try to reinterpret them. So, you know, the Burdwis do this, you know, Shia do this famously. Oh, every sect does this, right? Every sect does this in the past. One example, Inna ma yuridu Allahu li yudhiba ankum urijza ahl al bayti wa yutahirakum tathira. The O family of the O family Ahl al bayt, family of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah only wants to distance fault from you and to cleanse you and to purify you abundantly. Now, the Shia, when they read this ayah, Ahlul Bayt, for them, they say that this, this ayah refers to Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein. That's it. Yeah, that's that's Ahlul Bayt for them and their descendants, obviously. Ali and Fatima, Hassan and Hussein. Um, and we say, okay, 
uh, again, this is an example of they've already got their belief of what Ahlul Bayt means, what the term Ahlul Bayt means. When they read it in this ayah, they didn't impose their belief on the ayah. But the ayah doesn't mention anything about Hassan and Fatima, Hassan and Hussein and Ali and Fatima. There are some hadith that talk about this, but even that don't, don't specify it. Those hadith don't explicitly specify it. And then, if you look at the context, again, context in tafsir is very important, right? Look at the verses before and the verses after. And you find that Allah is talking about what? The wives of the Prophet Ya Nisa and Nabi, This is what the passage starts. O oh, wives of the Prophet, you're not like any other women, right? You're not like any other women. And then it goes on, talking about the wives of the Prophet. And then Allah says this statement. Allah wants to purify you of impurity, O Ahlul Bayt. So from the context, it's clear that the Ahlul Bayt is a far wider, broader concept than just Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein, just a concept alone. So here we have us using the Qur'an to derive our belief, right? which is the Ahlul Bayt includes the wives of the, all the wives of the Prophet, the eyes general, and them using their belief to actually explain the Qur'an that Ahlul Bayt means Ali and Fatima and their descendants. Does it make sense? So Aqeedah is very important to understand the Aqeedah of somebody making Tafsir and to see whether that Aqeedah will be impacting his, his, um, his Tafsir or not. Okay, so these are the different, some of the different causes of difference of opinion in Tafsir. So the creed of an individual, the difference in understanding of the same texts, right? and I said this is probably the majority of, of cause of differences, differences of opinion. Differences concerning the authenticity of texts, uh, the role of the aql, the role of the intellect, the, the role of Israeliyat and the way to give Israeliyat in, in tafsir. Abrogation, which verses are abrogating and which verses are abrogated, how many verses are abrogated, not only that, but what can abrogate what as well. This can also be a cause of difference of opinion. The usage of the Arabic language, yeah, different meanings of the words, the usage of particles, uh, phraseologies, grammatical constructs, all of this leads to differences of opinion. And uh, qira'at, you know, what constitutes a valid qira'a, and also the weight of a shahd qira'a. What weight does that have in giving tafsir as well? So these are just some, I've missed uh, a number out, but just to simplify it, that's some of the reasons why scholars will differ about tafsir. And when you read books of tafsir and you see different explanations given, if you've been following this and actually been taking notes, you'll be able to actually look at and see and understand why the different tafsir is coming out as well. And actually, more so than the latest scholars, it's actually really interesting when you look at the narrations of a Salaf and look at where they're deriving these tafsirs from, their tafsirs from. It's actually really, really it's a fascinating thing, a task or exercise to, to do, to look at their explanations and see, and most of it you see is language. You see how they're extracting and how they're deriving the tafsir from their understanding of the language. Any questions? We'll stop there. So you mentioned that there's a difference of opinion about whether the Sunnah can be abrogated or not. Yeah. So, so what's the most correct opinion is that you can? That it can. can. Is there an example of where There are examples. Um, I just couldn't remember any because I forgot to make notes about them. Imam Shafi is one of the most famous scholars in terms of uh, showing uh, Sunnah abrogating the Quran. Uh, remind me of next week. I'll give you an example for next week, inshallah. Mess send it on the message uh, on the group, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll send I'll do some examples. Probably something will come to me actually while we are having a break. But um, I'll think about it. Okay, so I'll we'll stop there. Yeah. Is it problematic to commingle the kira recitation? Like yes, it's not allowed. It's only one kira or the other kira. You can't mingle them together. Why? Because the messenger never taught it like this. He never taught them mixed together. He taught this qira'ah, and he taught this qira'ah, and he taught this qira'ah. Always separate. Can you do that? Like, let's say you're leading salah, and you want to do one, uh, uh, one rakat, one way, one rakat, the other way. Uh, scholars don't recommend this. And they say, why? Because it causes confusion to people who are listening. Yeah. Or maybe say, if, if, when you're reading salah, one time you move your finger, the other one keep it still. Both. Would that be fine? There's no it's no, uh, that would be that's not because what some scholars those scholars who say point it, yeah. they say you can't move it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and those scholars say you you move it 
Actually, so you're going to pick one or the other. Yeah, you can't pick it until you pick one or the other. Scholars have contradicted yeah. each other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 On that point, which one is the correct? Uh, or the, the, the more authentic or the more... Depends how much you trust that will remain. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> my view is you... My view is that you move your finger for all the du'a portions of the tashahud. And you keep it still for all the non-du'a portions of the tashahud. Isn't it all the du'a? So all the du'a portions. So at-tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat is not du'a. As-salamu alayka ayya nabi wa rahmatullah is du'a. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah is not du'a. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad is, is du'a. After the end of it's all du'a. And actually I find that helps me concentrate more. Because in your mind you're thinking, okay, I've stopped, you're stopping, you're linking the, what you're reading to the actual motion of the picture and I've actually, motion of the finger and I've actually find it actually helps me concentrate more on what I'm saying. The du'a is still. So no, du'a is moving. Du'a is moving. But there's lots of different opinions. Some scholars say all the way through, still all the way through pointing. Uh, the du'a portion is pointing, uh, moving, and non-du'a portion is still. Others say you do, uh, you keep it down all the way until you do the shahada, and then you raise your finger for the shahada alone. Then they differ about which portion of the shahada you raise, you raise your finger for. So there's lots of different opinions about this. There's multiple versions, and they're all authentic. They've all got authentic sources. They've all got reasoning behind them, yeah. It's a possibility, but most scholars don't take that as a possibility in this. There, there are other cases where they do, but in this case they don't because they actually uh, regard these to be mutually exclusive opinions as opposed to uh, he did this one point time, he did that another time. So was there a specific piece of evidence that, made, that led you to believe that that way of doing it throughout the movement? There's a hadith that the Messenger of Allah in Abu Dawud said mentioned that he would move his finger, yad biha, making dua with it. And that's the view of those scholars that said that you move it when you're making a du'a. So if people do different ways, should we beat them up? Over no. <laughs> do different ways? No, no, you just, you just follow one, just advise them. In Kuli, we had a Shalanka mosque, right? Um, and it was, uh, they would say at Ahli Adib, but they were just very simple. They were and they actually split, the mosque split because of the moving of the finger. So oh. one Jamal ended up praying in the community centre, and actually families, communities. It's crazy, man, it really is crazy. Like, and it was all pure to. To move in a finger, right? So in Pakistan, I've been told, I've, 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 you go into some hardcore Hanafi mosques, mm -hmm. if they see you moving your finger, they're going to, you know... They you know, do that in Cheshire. <laughs> Cheshire Islamic Centre. So but I remember I, I used to go, because I, when I go to visit my in-laws, I just go to local masjid. I used to, I would stop going. Right? And, um, and I would just go in there and do my rough and etc. And pray, as I normally pray, and um, they would give me such evil to man. And then, mm -hmm. then, then one of them pointed out, it's written in Udu, um, in the front, in the door of the masjid, or the wall of the masjid. It's like, what is it? Mazhabim Hanafi Maslaki Abriri, or something like this, right? So I said, fine, okay, fine. Uh, if, that's what you, if, that, if that's what you are telling me, I know we're back to the Masjid. I said, that's fine. This, this happens in Salafi Masjid as well. So when I go back to Pakistan, my dad in law takes me to Salafi Masjid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I get evils for the fact that my ankles are covered. Yeah, yeah. And people literally stare at me like, we're about to pray. You need to yeah, yeah, yeah. hitch up your. That's crazy. Just, just yeah, I mean, again, this this way going back. To, uh, this, why you can't mix and match? Right. I saw, again, from some of the Arabs. Some of the, the Arabs you see some of the strangest things, right? So, um, there's an Arab. He's praying completely like a Hanafi, right? And so his his hands are below his knees, nails, right? But he goes into Ruku, and he's to the knees, and there's a group of them, and they go into Ruku. They come back back from Ruku, and they put their hands back on their chest. Right? So, and I think. He, I've never seen that before, ever in my life, right? Because Hanafis were never, just oh, putting on the chest in never going to happen, right? They're just covering all the bases. <laughs> covering all the bases. <laughs> so after the Rukul, so before the Rukul, the fact that everything is, is down here, right? After the Rukul, they, they put their hands back on the chest up here, and I think, what the hell is this? It's like, this is why you can't mix and match. This is just, it doesn't make any sense. You're just mixing and matching from a different... I've got I think... There. Sorry, can I've got up in Bradford, when they do it on the heart, have you seen that? The Shafis <laughs> do it here. Yeah, the Shafis do it here. It's more, if you look at Malaysians, very most of Malaysians would have it here. I think Again, part of that, result, that result, also comes from the worry of, I think lots of lay people have this worry, I'm doing it wrong. Yeah. But really you should exert your effort in terms of what I think is correct and then go with it. Yeah. Right? You, you put your effort in, you've shown sincerity, right? The rest you just leave it up to Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, don't, don't, don't. Yeah. Don't overthink these things. It's good to be cautious and careful, but don't overthink them. Yeah. Brother from Woking went to Pakistan to pray. And then um, he said, Amin out loud. And the Imam stopped the prayer and he turned around and said, Who's that dog barking? <laughs> <laughs> no way. 
Yeah. I've heard stories like that as well. I've heard stories like that as well. I think I've told I've told the story. Here in the UK? In Leeds. Where's the market? I, I had just to the much to the mid. So if I'm in Wise, you're a nice lad. I mean, if I'm in Jubilee, I'll make sure it's nice. Uh, uh, Wise, nobody can be doing that. Yeah, yeah. Faye, how are you? No, it's all easy. easy. No, no, no. Jubilee is no problems. No. Yeah. Actually, no, it's not as bad as you should. Back in my days, when I was about 30 years ago, you would think that back in my days, even more than that, 35. When I was 15, and they were like, yeah, and I was going to the masjid Jubilee. There was only mm. Jubilee in those days. Mm. Either roughly then, I mean, now they would be in trouble. J- just another question on that. I think. Um, but nowadays, well, I, I, I pray Jubilee sometimes mm. when I have meetings there, whatever, and they're, they're, they're fine nowadays. Mm. But if you're going into a masjid where you know you're going to get pelters for not wearing a hat or you know moving your feet, yeah, is said, it well, better to just yeah. follow what they do? Do what they do, avoid the fitna. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, some masjids you go into Ramadan and they pray uh, uh, with it very differently. <coughs> Yeah. And they yeah. start giving you looks if you pray differently. You just follow what just they follow do. Thing, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Two questions as well, Fahim's question actually. Regarding reciting the uh, different qur'ats in salah, is it, you said it's not recommended. Is, does that have to do with false salah? Because like some masjid, masjid, they do it in like qiyam and voluntary salah. No, regardless, if, if it's going to confuse the people in the back who are leading the prayer, okay. um, then or you tell them. But if, for example, what, what I understood from his question was that some people, what they do is they, for each rakah, they change a qira'ah. And then the people, I mean, what the hell's going on, right? Especially if it's like surahs that you're familiar with, like the shorter surahs. And you're just confusing the people. Some and then, then they recommend, in that case, they recommend you not doing it. But if you're telling the people and they understand, yeah. then that's different. Okay. And, what, and regards to... Recite- and in some messages, you actually find people correcting the imam, <laughs> right, because he's reciting differently. And then they, they get really upset when the imam isn't listening to them, but not going and correcting themselves. Because they don't realise that the qira'ah is different, right? Regarding reciting a different crowd, do you have to be like an expert in it, or um, you can't just like pick up a different crowd? No, you have to. You have to have a jaza in it, jazz or be taught. Have been taught it. Yeah, not necessarily jaza, but you have been taught it. Like all of us, we recite hafs. You don't get jazas and hafs right, but we have been taught that. Okay. You can't just pick up a book, uh, the warsh, what myself and, and decide okay, you know, okay, I'll, I'll learn myself, and I'll, you have to have, have been taught it. Kira is, is very important. Very, you be very careful about it. Okay, Zach, we'll stop there.